Welcome to worship here at First English Lutheran Church. Tonight is Monday, Thursday, when our worship centers around the story of Jesus sharing a last meal with his disciples, washing their feet, and giving them a new commandment to love as deeply as he loves us. Whether you are at Grace or participating by live stream or recorded video, we hope this time of worship, renewal, and growth in faith. Worship tonight ends with the stripping of the altar, a stark reminder of Jesus' betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. We gather again for worship tomorrow at noon for our midday worship, and then in the evening at 7 p.m. for our Good Friday service. And then again on Sunday morning, for our Easter worship at 8 and 10 a.m., with Easter breakfast serving between 8.30 and 10.30. I invite you to now stand as you're comfortable doing so, and we begin tonight with confession and forgiveness. When God made us, God knew what we needed to thrive, and God made the earth creative and abundant. God gives us each other, partners in caring for the earth and all its creatures. Yet, even when God gives us everything we need, we hunger for more. Please join me as we confess our sin together. First, consider how have you harmed your relationship with God, with your neighbor, and with yourself. Now we confess our sins together. We know we have harmed each other and damaged our relationship with you, but we fear that admitting our sin will cause you to abandon us. So we create distractions to hide what we have done. We point our fingers at the faults of others and we avoid you. God, you are perfect and holy, but we are imperfect and lowly. And you know we have broken trust and abandoned faith. What have we done? Is it too late to receive your forgiveness? Friends, even when we sin, God does not accuse. God only asks what we have <coughs> excuse me, only God only asks what we have done so that we can set down our guilt, and God only asks where we have gone because God wants to bring us back. Jesus died to reveal the limitless depths of God's love. You can doubt this love, but you can never change the truth of it. God knows all and forgives all. The only question remains is whether we can accept that love so freely given. Let us pray. 
Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment, to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment on our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Exodus, the twelfth chapter. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they shall, be, shall take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year-old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb the same night. They shall eat it roasted with fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall take none of, the, none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. All on the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our psalm today is 116. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me. Whenever I called, I shall repay the Lord for the good things God has done for me. I will lift up the cup of salvation and I will call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid, you have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. <laughs> The Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. And he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. For now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So I want you to think of a time where you experienced something really kind of gross. Anything at all that you can kind of come up with. Maybe something you had to clean up after or something that got spilled, or, or, you know, whatever it might be, just something that was really kind of gross. And once you have that memory or that experience, I want you also to think about how long did it take afterwards to really feel like you were clean from that experience, to really feel like every part of it had been washed away. For me, when I was younger, we used to go down to Florida often in the summer because that's where uh, my mom is originally from, Bradenton area, if you know it. And one day I was with my cousins and, you know, being uh, mostly raised in Wisconsin, we would come down in our, our, our socks and our shoes. And, our, and my cousins, they would look at me and they would say, you know, why are you wearing socks? <laughs> it's, it's 85 degrees outside. Everybody just wears sandals and wa- or, or goes barefoot, one or the other. Uh, so wanting to fit in and not wanting to stick out uh, for my cousins, I took off my socks and my shoes. And we were uh, heading out to go to the lake uh, to get on a boat and, and um, you know, be on the water. And I remember we were running through this yard uh, to get to the boat and wouldn't you know it, no socks, no shoes, and suddenly I stepped in something. And I bet you can probably imagine what it was. A little dog had probably left, or maybe a big dog (laughs) in this case, had left me a little present, and I stepped right into it. And it was all over my foot, in between my toes, Pretty gross. I immediately, of course, went down into the lake and I washed my foot off and I got it as clean as I could. 
And of course, that night I went home and I took a shower and I, I washed my foot again. But you know, it took a little while before it really felt clean again. Before I really felt like all of that had been washed away. And if you know anything about the people of this era that the disciples and Jesus lived, you know that their feet also got pretty dirty, pretty dusty and dingy and probably pretty smelly. And so it was really quite customary to, when once entering into a home before partaking of a meal, to uh, wash the feet, to sit down and, and, and wash the feet off and have them be clean. But oftentimes, the person who did the washing was, of course, somebody who was either a servant or somebody of a lower class. Somebody else often was relegated to this gross, not very uh, 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 clean or, or, or a <laughs> good task, right? This was not something people often wanted to do. Uh, so it was often relegated to those of lower standing. But here in Holy Week, as is often the case throughout this week, we enter into a bit of a mystery about cleanliness and about who is supposed to wash who. Jesus, of course, gets down and washes the defeat of the disciples. And what do you think those disciples experienced in that moment? Perhaps shock, as Peter later seems to indicate, a sense of, what are you doing, Jesus? This is not something we would expect from somebody who we regard so highly. It's almost like, imagine you come home and you find Jesus cleaning your bathroom, your toilet even. You might feel a similar kind of shock. Because there's a certain uncleanliness that we like to keep out of view, right? There's a certain compartmentalization about those kinds of things that, you know, the feet are, are maybe a spot, like if we lived in an ancient world, where we wouldn't want to often think about the things we stepped in. we just leave somebody else to, to clean that up for us. We don't have to think about it. Keeping that uncleanliness about ourselves or or anything like that, kind of out of view, out of mind, so to speak. So to see Jesus enter into that would be a little bit shocking, a little bit uh, unconscionable, maybe even. Peter represents this when he comes, uh, and as always, as often the case with Peter, introduces a sort of hitch with this manner of Lord and teacher watching the defeat of the disciples. Initially, he seems to kind of protest with his question, do you wash my feet, Lord? Shouldn't it be me who's washing your feet? But he's convinced by Jesus' words, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Then, of course, Peter wishes to be washed head to toe in that typical Peter expression. So it brings to mind a question for us on this Monday, Thursday. What does it really mean to be clean? How do we achieve that state? How do we get there? Well, this is Holy Week, after all. So you're likely to hear about Jesus' death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. You'll hear about how when we turn to God in confession of our sin and in the name of Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. But perhaps even when we believe, we might still struggle to always feel clean, like that experience of something really quite gross, it takes time, doesn't it, to feel like I'm clean again. 
We might turn to God in confession, and we might believe in forgiveness. But do we really feel clean? It's a question worth pondering and perhaps wrestling with as we continue this holy week. Because you'll notice Judas gets special mention, of course, around this time of the year. And in this passage, he was present, probably one of those who was washed by Jesus. And yet Jesus pronounces him as not being clean. So, of course, we know it's more than just the cleanliness of our bodies, of our feet. Something more occurs here. And in John's gospel here, it has, of course, to do with Jesus, not as just teacher, but as Lord, as Savior, as the one who is God come into the world. And although we can make all kinds of speculation, we really don't know why Judas does what he does. But we can say he just couldn't experience this cleansing reality of Christ. His feet were clean, but what about the rest of them? As mentioned, sometimes we can come into this Holy Week and maybe feel a little bit similar, at least in our struggle to really feel clean. We want to keep all of that aside. Keep it out of view. Keep it away from anybody else seeing it. But on Monday, Thursday, Christ invites us to bring our whole selves into this moment. Christ invites us to bring all of who we are, head to toe, clean or unclean, into the presence of our Lord and our Teacher and our Savior, to be washed. To be cleaned. To come to the foot of the cross. And to bring all of this gross reality of ourselves and of our world as being fully present fully there, fully seen. Because you'll notice how at the end of this act of foot washing, Jesus ties it to love. It is love that washes us clean. It is love that brings us to belief in Christ as being present in our very bodies by the power of the Spirit. During this Holy Week, we recall our baptism, when we were washed in the water and united with Christ in his death and resurrection and thereby sealed with the Holy Spirit. Cleansed. Because it is God by the power of the Spirit who now dwells within us. And it is love that brings us to wholeness in our personhood, in our humanity, in our very bodies through the action of loving each other. Because I'm not the only one who has been running through grass one day and landing in a little present dropped by a dog, right? We all have our moments. 
But because of that love of Christ that now resides in us, we all have that same responsibility to love each other. You notice how in verse 31, Jesus says, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. You see, love brings the divine into our world. Love cleanses it all with the grace of Christ. We now love one another as Christ loves us because Christ is in us. So as we come to the cross of Good Friday, we bring our whole selves. Not only because we know that there on the cross lays the sin of the world, but because our eyes have been washed. Like Peter, head to toe, we have been washed. And though the world sees death on a cross, we see love transform death into life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join in now as we proclaim our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Each prayer will end with merciful God. Please respond by saying, receive our prayer. You make a new covenant with your people. Gather your church around word and table in love and promise as these three holy days enfold us. Open us to behold the mystery of our salvation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You give us our daily bread, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. Bless those who labor and tend to their crops 
and those who prepare our meals. Strengthen us to advocate for food justice and a fair distribution of resources. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You, our Savior and teacher, stoop down to us in servant love. Inspire national and local leaders with a renewed sense of public service. Increase in them a humility to serve with equity and fairness. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You incline your ear to us in every need. Befriend all who are lonely. Comfort those who grieve. Soothe any who are anxious. Console all who are distressed. Graciously tend to the hurts of your children who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Especially those we name in the silence of our hearts now. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your abundant promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. is welcome at the communion table where Jesus feeds us and is present with us in the bread and wine, a tangible sign of God's forgiveness and love for us. Where is our God? God is here in this place. Where are your hearts? We have given them to God. What shall we do in the presence of our God? We shall give our thanks and praise. It is right to offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For after he entered Jerusalem in triumph, and before his, he suffered and died, he carved a moment away from the pressures of the world to set the table, and that the world and would draw all the people in. People of God, hear the words of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will, Thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 